Uh, bless you. Glad to have you with us today. We welcome you in the name of the Lord here at our worship service at the Church of Trophy Lakes. Welcome those that join us online uh, every week as well. And uh, God bless you for being part uh, of our, our fellowship and be a regular attender. We've got something brand new for you to be able to see us. It makes it a little easier to tell people now is that we finally have a new website up and going. We're still adding to it, still making it better along the way. And Terry's going to try to walk it over today. Are you going to be able to do it today and uh, get it uh, where I can show you a couple of things on it? But one thing I will tell you before we do that, if we're able to do it, is this, that there is a button on that front screen bigger than anything that says live. You just have to tell people starting today to go to trophylakes.org. That is our website. And click there and they can watch our streaming, our live streaming there every Sunday at 11 o'clock. It's still available on Facebook, but it's also being streamed right directly from our website there. And it makes it a lot easier to tell people how to find us and uh, how to be a part uh, of what we're doing. And so you can see it there a little bit. See Watch Live over there on the uh, left-hand side on the bottom. Also, the middle button there is our current bulletin. Uh, that we have. You don't need to click it if you don't, if it'll, it'll mess anything up right now because it's hard to, for her to navigate on there to do this. And then I have been working diligently on our media vault, all of our sermon series in the last couple of years anyway, put them on there. Each one of them has a tag uh, with it to tell you what that message was about and uh, has uh, obviously scripture and information is there. We've also are putting those that we have uh, that uh, our own elders and pastors that speak in, in there, their, their messages, we're getting those on there as well. We have uh, Mr. Uh, John Snyder, who was with us last March. More people watch that YouTube video than anything that we've ever uh, put out there. His message, uh, uh, Testimony of Healing, now I have it on the website. You can go to it and do it. It also has the MP3, so if you just want the audio, uh, you can get it right off of there as well, too. A lot of people walk or are busy or something and want something in their ear to listen to and want to hear my good voice, you know, no, maybe one of the other pastor's uh, messages or something, but there's a lot of great teaching that we've done. I've been pretty amazed going back over this. We put a lot of stuff out in the last couple of years and a lot of really good teaching about uh, some different subjects that are on there, so you can go in there and find all that. If um, you remember on these websites today, no matter what screen you have, if you're on your phone, if you're on your iPad or iPad, or if you're on a uh, computer screen or wherever you access the internet, you have to roll, have to scroll up. And there are a lot of things all the way down through there, a lot of pictures from our church. Whatever the latest message is will always be up there right now. The one from last week is up there. This afternoon we'll have a, have a, a newer one up, also directions, all that good stuff that is, is on there. Now the most important thing to remember is up there in that far corner that says give, we are transferring over to a new system and doing this, so we're asking everybody to, to, to give and give quickly and give generously and give often, but seriously, that first time, you got to reset it up a little bit. You all pay bills online, do things online. You know how to do this. It just takes a little bit that first time. The next time, you can log right in from your computer and, and taking time. I'm going to have, the next week, you're going to have a couple of weeks. This is going to be before we get all this out here. We're going to have a text to give phrase. I'm trying to figure out what that phrase needs to be that we get registered, where you can set up, where you can just text that particular uh, name, like Trophy Lakes or 800 Trophy Lakes or something like that, and that you can give that way uh, uh, as well. Also, we will have a brand new app uh, out here soon. Uh, we're still working on some of the details. A lot goes into that, but as soon as it is ready, we'll be presenting it to you. And that app, you can do everything from the website. You can give off the app like some of you do even now with the old one, but this one will actually be a Church at Trophy Lakes app uh, directly for us, not just Alexio like we've had in the past. So it'll be a, a direct one. You can watch the program from the app, and you can go and, and access some of the uh, me previous messages, or if you missed a Sunday you want to catch up, it'll have all that on there as well too. So that is coming real soon, and all that will be ready. But it, it's very simple on there. You put the amount of dollars in, in and add lots of zeros behind it, and uh, then you can give one time. You can just follow that on. There's a select. Oh, there you go. Terry's giving $100,000. Hey, by the way, that's set to my bank account right now. Don't do that. I know that's on my bank. It won't matter. Go ahead and do it. I don't have that much money in there, you know, but I just got to think about that. It's set to my, uh, my, my account right now. We haven't got to figure out how to get that off of there, you know, 
and doing that. So don't get too uh, generous with other people's money. Anyway, you've got the select funds. We got right now. I've got the seed offering at the bottom. We're going to combine some of those, make it as simple as possible. Obviously, the top one, which we have on there right now, general fund tithe. That's our main uh, offering, the tithe that we give to to take care of all the expenses for us to have a facility and all that goes with that. And when you tell it to give, that's when it goes to fill out the information that are on there. And it'll, it'll take you into that. And that's when you say, if you have an account, you log in. And, and if you don't, you have to set it up. It's up there in the corner to log in. And so you, you, you can find your way around these. But I want everybody to hopefully do it this month. Give something. Uh, if you're not a regular giver or whatever, give some, get your, your name in the system. And uh, so we can get all that transferred over throughout the month of February and get it finished here. So it's all right there for you. You'll also have access to your account when you sign in and log in so that you can keep up with, with your own gifts and, and those type of things that are there as well. So thank you, Terry, for putting that out there for us today. To see that, hope you've gone to the website, looked at that. I know this, as I am updating these messages, it takes 45 minutes to upload every video. As I'm uploading the videos for all these messages for previous series, I, all at once I'm looking up at the analytics and people are already watching these. And uh, there's like three people that watch this one. You know, I think, I, I've only had it up for like a week. And uh, so I'm really glad that you or others are using that. Very, very grateful for that. Well, let's jump in before we get out of time today to the, to the Bible and get in our message today. And uh, it's easy today, the second chapter of Genesis, one uh, verse there, the latter part of Genesis chapter 2, we find uh, there that it is written an account of how a woman was created. If you remember, God said it's good, it's good, it's good, it's good seven times in Genesis chapter 1. After he created each day, he said it's good. And then you come to chapter 2, and all at once he says it's not good. It's not good for man to be alone. And the wonderful story of the... Uh, uh, creation of Eve there as she was named by Adam is given and we've already talked about that and talking about our foundation that God made us that God is the one that is the creator God is God's the creator God's the creator of, of human humanity of human beings but God created us male and female we saw that last week he points that out specifically this week we're going to look at God is the creator of marriage all of these are societal foundations, biblical foundations for society to operate. And it's amazing as we look at each one of these so far, and this is uh, our fifth one to look at today, and each one of these we've run away from. We don't want to believe in God today. We don't want to believe God's the creator of man. We, we've thrown God out and put scientism in its place. And so no, we, we, God didn't do this. We, we don't want to believe God made humanity we just, uh, you know, went from the goo to the zoo to you, you know. We don't, we don't want to believe in that. And so we don't want to believe, uh, we're, we're running from all these. We don't want to believe in male and female anymore. Simplistic way God has made us to function. And certainly today we're running away from this one as well, marriage. But yet it's mentioned right here in the second chapter of the book of Genesis. And after God presents Eve to Adam and he calls her Eve and says this is bone on bones and flesh and my blood she shall be called woman she was taken out of the man here's our verse verse 24 and verse 25 therefore a man shall leave his father and mother be joined to his wife and they shall become one flesh verse 25 says and they were both naked and the man and his wife and they were not ashamed one of the Great privileges of being a pastor is that I get to officiate uh, in marriage ceremonies. I have done a lot of marriage ceremonies through the years. I was a college pastor at a church for years, so I did sometimes two a week. And then I uh, pastored larger churches at times and had all kinds of weddings. Never turned weddings down, never put them off on other staff. I've always, Amy and I have always enjoyed being a part and helping and, and part of that special day for people. I've been privileged to do and officiate at weddings in cathedrals and small churches in my office, uh, uh, in a barn one time. Uh, I've done them about everywhere. Matter of fact, I, I did one one time over a hot tub at a ski resort. That has a long story with it that we can tell some other time. Thousands of stories come with those weddings, some humorous, some not so humorous. Of all of those weddings, there's one that I thought of when I was preparing this message that I wish I could sometimes forget, 
And uh, it, was, it was a wedding. Let me just tell you this real quick. I, it was a Saturday afternoon, and I had a big wedding to be a part of that day. But these people, being so inconsiderate, they planned their wedding on the same day that Tennessee was playing football. It just really bugs me when people do that. So I was watching a football game at home. I knew there was no reason for me to get to the church early. I had everything ready. They could do all the worrying. Get it. I get there and walk right in. They can do the, do the, the ceremony. And uh, Amy had taken our kids and gone to a parade in another part of town. And, and I was there watching the football game, trying to get every minute of it I could before I just would dash to the church at the last minute to do this ceremony. Well... When I finally realized it was time to get ready, I ran back to my closet, could not find my tuxedo shirt anywhere. Amy's not there, I'm helpless, can't even dress myself, you know, can't find anything, you know. Finally, I find it, you know, get it on, get dressed, run, boy, I'm cutting it kind of close now. I get to the church, and when I get there, one of our custodians had uh, decided that he had all of his work done and ready, and during the actual ceremony itself, he was going to leave and go get something to eat, and he locked my office up when he did that, and the ceremony was laying on my desk. Now, this was one of those really big weddings where they had a wedding coordinator who believed that if it was a 2 o'clock wedding, the bride is walking down the aisle at 2 o'clock. This is going to be on time. It's about 5 till 2. I'm in there panicking. I don't have a wedding ceremony. Can't get into my office. What am I going to do? The wedding director came in there and said, Pastor, are we going to have a wedding on time today? I said, yes, ma'am. We're going to have a wedding on time today. I went into one of my associate's office and grabbed a piece of paper that would fit into my Bible. And I wrote on it, welcome, introduction, rings, candle, you know, and just I got a little outline down. And I'm always, on, especially a big wedding like that, when the groom's about to walk out with the best man, the pastor, we're standing on the side. He's usually so nervous as before it. And I always tell a joke and set him at ease and try to calm him down a little bit. I was standing over there so nervous that he said, pastor, are you okay? Are you going to be able to make it today? And I went, yes, I, we're going to do fine. We're going to do fine. I walked out in front of a full congregation of people, a very big wedding, and I started off the ceremony, and I started going through it. I did not miss a word. I was cruising, and the more I was cruising, the more proud I was of myself. I had it down. I said the two outside the candles of the center of candelabra have been lighted to represent the lives of soil. I mean, I was just going through it. I mean, I've done it a thousand times. I know it. I get all the way to the very end. And what is the last thing I say? You may kiss your bride. And I say that when he gets through kissing the bride. I say, would you turn, and I'll use me and Amy's name so you can understand the mistake I made. Her maiden name is Thornburg. I turned, and by this time, I'm strutting like a peacock. I've got it all done, you know. And I said, ladies and gentlemen, my last line. It is with great joy that I present to you Mr. and Mrs. Amy Thornburg. Everybody looked at me, the bride and groom turned around and looked at me, and I said, I, I mean, Mr. and Mrs. Barry Klingon, you know, and, and got it right. Then I thought, the last line, and I messed it up. I had it all the way down to the end. I thought of the scripture, says, to he who thinks he stand, take heed, lest he fall, you know, or pride goeth before destruction in that moment. But, you know, it's, it's an amazing thing that all these years, I'm obviously Protestant, um, was ordained as a Southern Baptist when I started, and and we don't have a, a book that tells us how to marry people. We are a free church tradition. And so my pastor mentored me, and, and I used his ceremony. And then it was the one that we used for when we were married. Later, I did some uh, weddings before we were married. And, and so, you know, I've, I've had this ceremony all along. And so I know it by now. If you were in church the last Sunday of this year, not many of you were, that Sunday in between Christmas and New Year's, we had a wedding service as part of the of the ceremony, of a, a wedding ceremony as part of the service that day. Uh, a young couple that had come by and, and uh, wanted to get married. Both of them were shipping out to the service, and one of them was going to be stationed in Georgia, and one was going to be stationed in Washington State. And they did not want to get married by a judge. They wanted a preacher to marry them, a man of God, as they said. And we talked with them about what they and they knew the Lord and all this. And I said, well, let's just do it. And I stood up here, and I had several people afterwards say, Pastor, you didn't have a note in your hand, and you went right. I know it. I kind of got it down by now. And I want you to hear a part of the ceremony that I do. I've done it with some that I've actually officiated in this room. And you've seen it, maybe if you've been to one. But listen to these words in the context of us talking about marriage today as God has given it to us. 
I'll use me and Amy's name in it as if we're the ones being married. Because the image of God indwells us, we are able to know and personally experience love. It has been said that he that abideth in love abideth in God. We have been invited today to hear Barry and Amy as they face the future together, accepting whatever may lie ahead. These surroundings were not chosen by chance, just as Barry and Amy do not believe they met by chance. But they believe that God directed them to be in the same place at the same time. It is God that creates marriage. It is ordained of heaven. It is the first and holiest institution among men. It was the Lord God himself who said, it is not good for man to be alone. I will make him a companion, a lover, a friend, a partner, a wife. Thus God himself performed the first marriage in the paradise of Eden. The Lord did not take woman from the man's head that he might dominate her. I'm going to to take a sip. I'm just getting so emotional about this. Excuse me. The Lord did not take the woman from the man's head that he might dominate her, nor from his feet that he might step upon her, but from a rib near his heart that he might love her. Our Lord graced the wedding at Cana of Galilee with his presence and chose this occasion for the performance of his first miracle. Paul the apostle chose the figure of marriage to talk about the beautiful union and love of Christ and his people. And in the last book of the New Testament, John the Apostle describes the final union of Christ and his people as a marriage feast. Marriage, here it is, has always been the cornerstone of an orderly society. It is not to be entered into lightly, but reverently and with the knowledge of God's presence and approval. I charge you, Barry, and I charge you, Amy, that today you remember that this covenant is not only a pledge of faith and trust in each other, but it is a promise to God to honor the vows that you are about to make. How God can take two lives and make them one is a great mystery, a mystery of heaven, but one that will be a strength and a blessing to you both for as long as time shall last. Now, I could go on and on and on with that, but you see that section there where we say that every time. It's the cornerstone of an orderly society. That's what marriage is. God created marriage. Now, I want to give you a couple things here today out of this passage and a, and a, little, a few extra things alongside of it as well as we talk about this foundation, this mandate that he gives us of marriage found in Genesis 2. And I'm just going to kind of tell you where I'm going, and I'm going to have to really get on the, the horse and ride fast to get this finished today. Because there's a lot here, but I'm going to just go through it. I want to first give you a societal foundation of marriage that is given here. And then I want, to, I want to give you the divine order of marriage that is given here. And then I want to end with the human objections. I hope I have time to cover some of the human objections to marriage that we hear so often today and see what God has to say about them. First of all, the societal foundation for marriage. It is interesting that the passage that is in verse 24 was quoted in the New Testament by both Jesus and Paul, quoted this as an appeal to creation for the foundation of marriage. It's very important that we understand that this idea of monogamous marriage of a husband and wife, and it didn't begin in America. It didn't begin back in the 1950s or sometime. It, it began with God from the very beginning and interestingly in this one small verse in verse 24 we do not get polygamy we do not get concubines we don't get the keeping of mistresses here we don't get adultery we don't get uh, homosexuality or cohabitation or promiscuity we, we don't get uh, living together outside the marriage bond or serial marriage we get one man one woman one life now, Jesus, obviously, when he taught us over in Matthew chapter 19, when they asked him about marriage, said the reality, we live in a fallen world, and there's the reality of divorce, and there's the reality of things that fall below that. But just because we make confusing what God made clear, and just because we make crooked what God made straight, doesn't mean we don't still have a biblical foundation in our life that we aim for and recognize is the standard that is given to us. I don't have time today to go into all of this, but 
I want you to, to know this idea and just kind of see a little history with me here. If you take just about 400 years after Jesus was born, the church had many church fathers during those centuries before, and many had spoken on, 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 on several subjects in theology, and the church had certainly settled on, on what they believed and all this, but along came St. Augustine, or Augustine as some call him, and he really wrote down a lot of things. He really put to, 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 to writing those things that really would shape us for, for many years to come, and marriage was not an exception. Now think about the day that Augustine lived and how similar it is to ours. He dealt with two extremes in the world that Augustine lived. And here was what he dealt with. One side was this group called the Manichaeans. And he was always arguing and fighting with them about doctrine and, and, and trying to settle what the true doctrine was from what they did. And they, they were the kind of people, very simplistically, that believed in spirit. And flesh was all bad. So spirit, if we're really, it's all really about spirit. Flesh is bad. So they... They didn't like marriage because they, they thought the whole idea of reproduction and all that was bad. And, and so they just, they, they, you've got to be spiritual. It's all about spirit. So that's almost like an asceticism that's on one side. On the other side, he had the Roman people. And the Roman people were much like our culture today. There was just about everything under the sun that could be practiced. Uh, and marriage and divorce was very easy uh, obtained in that Roman culture. And so that's almost like a hedonism, a pleasure. So he's got these two extremes Augusta does. So he says, here's what the Bible teaches. And here's what we as believers believe is the creation foundation. He said, these things, these are the goods, he said, of marriage. Procreation, that's having children. Faithfulness, fidelity, he called it. And sacramental permanence. Now, I want you to know, those three things, without going into the details of all of those, that became the Christian ethic for society that flowered the entire Western civilization for, for many years after that. It, it, it worked in others. And then after the Reformation, and listen, in America, judges and the Supreme Court would make rulings about different things about marriage, and they would always go back and cite an Augustinian view of what natural marriage was all about until we got to 1972. 1971, the Minnesota Supreme Court, in an opinion, said these words, the institution of marriage is a union of man and woman uniquely involving the procreation and rearing of children within a family is as old as the book of Genesis. See, once again, they're citing this ethic. But then the next year, they moved away from it. Supreme Court, I won't go into the details, made a decision that absolutely redefined marriage away from that biblical view that had lasted all those thousands of years. And then now we've made more and more decisions, culminating with the Oberfeld decision several years ago that just totally redefined it away from a biblical mandate. And as a result, there is all kinds of issues that we're dealing with today that we've never had to deal with before. Can, can I just tell you how simple it is? When we move away from creation foundations, I say it this way, we always do so to our own peril. Uh, the problems that come, you know, listen, billions and billions of dollars are spent by the United States government combating problems that arise because we don't follow that very clear norm that's right there. When you have a husband and a wife, when you have a mother and a father in the home, it's amazing how many problems go away that we face as society. So we walked away from it. Now, what do I, just real quickly in the societal foundation, what do I draw out of this? First of all, I'm just going to have to mention these. The relationship of marriage takes precedence over all other relationships except your relationship with God. Obviously, God created them, and that was first. But the marriage relationship begins to take precedence. More than even that, which you love your own children and your other family members and friends and everything else, that marriage relationship takes precedence. Number two, the simple principle is in here. Leave and cleave. The old King James Version says they will cleave, he will cleave to his wife. We say join to his wife in the new King James Version I read to you uh, today. But it's this idea of leaving and cleave. This was revolutionary, even from the beginning. These families, you just stay, you stay, you stay. No, no, no. Leave and cleave. I've been doing a lot of marriage counseling throughout my ministry. And you know, I always like to say when they walk in, when somebody walks in and having marriage problems, before they ever come in the door, 
I know it's going to be one of, I used to always say one of three things, but it's really now I've added four because I've discovered a fourth one through the years. What, what are, well, you know what they'd be. First, money, you know, people got money problems, you know. Uh, physical, secondly, sex problems there. Then the communication, we're not communicating our needs to one another. And you know what the one I've added? In-laws. <laughs> yeah. Helicopter parents that just want to be involved in the, what does it say? Leave and cleave. A new dynamic begins when the husband and wife are married and they move out from under that and become important to one another over even those that they have left, mother and, and father. By the way, of those four that I mentioned, do you notice the one that kind of stands out different? Communication? You know, when you look at it, what about money? Green money has never caused anybody to fight. It's an inanimate object. What is the problem? We got to talk about how we're going to spend that money or not spend that money. Communication. The physical act in marriage is described in the book of Genesis that Adam knew his wife Eve. We say he knew her in the biblical sense. What is that? It's communication. Now, I don't want to be crude on a Sunday morning, but if there is nothing wrong with your bodies physically, what's the problem there? Communication. So what becomes in-laws? You're stuck with who you got. You can't change them, okay? So you've got to communicate how you're going to deal with those in-laws. So really, there's just one issue that it always comes down to in marriage, and that's communication that we have. But he says, leave and cleave here. There's a couple others I'd mention that draws out of this, but is very amplified in the New Testament, and that is there is spiritual power in marriage. There's always power in obedience to God, but God created this to give us a a spiritual power center. In, in the New Testament, Paul is discussing uh, marriage, and or excuse me, Peter is over in 1 Peter chapter 3, and he's telling husbands what they ought to do and wives what they ought to do. And then he says at the very end of it in verse 7, that your prayers be not hindered. There is incredible power of a husband and wife coming together in agreement in prayer. Power in marriage. And then notice that last verse here, naked and unashamed. Can you imagine a world, no deadbolts, no locks, no guns? Don't need that gun beside your bed to get somebody that's trying to attack you. Uh, no secret passwords, no shame. Complete transparency is what he has given us here is that creation mandate. You see that societal foundation. But can I tell you something else too? There's a divine order of marriage that we find in this verse. A divine order that is given to marriage. The process has a plan and it has a divine order that comes with it. Now what they say here in verse 24, what is revealed in scripture here is amplified later, especially in the book that Song of Solomon that Solomon is attributed to writing. That is a powerful book that is over there by the Psalms and wisdom literature. And it gives us these just real clear divine order thinking about this when Amy and I were kids so in our time of being in elementary school or whatever you know if you if you liked a girl or some girl started liking you as a guy or whatever then the kids would pick on you and you know there was a little ditty they used to say back in those days anybody ever remember this I'll use me and Amy's name in it and say and they see me kind of liking her or something so the kids in elementary school say Barry and Amy sitting in a tree K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes Amy with a baby carriage. Has anybody ever heard that before, you know? Hey, kids. That, you know, it's funny they said that in elementary school. Did you notice there was an order to that? First comes love, then comes marriage, then comes a baby carriage. I'm afraid they'd have to say it differently the way we act today. Today they would say, Barry and Amy sitting in a tree, K-I-S-S-I-N-G. First comes sex, then comes a baby, then maybe comes marriage if you want it later. That's the way we've messed up the order. But that old ditty had a order to it and a structure to it that's biblical. I taught my kids the four C's that we learned, and we learned the divine order they come in. And they're clearly given to us in the book of Song of Solomon. And they're right here as well. What are they? Number one, courtship. 
Now, listen, every culture changes in the way that they might date or the way that they may first be attracted to one another and be together. Every culture is different, but here's what we know about courtship. Parents are in charge of courtship. Parents make the rules about courtship. You are in charge. The church is not in charge. The world's not in charge. Parents are responsible for how their children are going to begin to date, when they're going to date, and all that is part of that. Courtship's where it all begins. The second step in the divine order is commitment. At some point in the courtship, there comes a point where we're going to make this official and we're going to, and the New Testament word was be betrothed to one another, or is the word we may use today, engagement. A commitment is made to take this relationship to the marriage level. Commitment. Third one, you'll be surprised at this, but it's in the Bible, celebration. Now I use the word celebration, and you may not have a huge wedding with thousands of people in attendance. You may get married in the preacher's office or at, at home or, or whatever, but listen, there has to come a time, biblically, in order, where husband and wife stand and commit to one another publicly. I have done many marriage ceremonies where it's just me and the bride and the groom in the room. But they publicly are speaking out and saying, I want you and I want you and I commit to you. There is a place for that. So where we at? Courtship, uh, commitment, and then celebration. And then guess what the last C is? Consummation. And you know what that means. Now listen, what I told my kids growing up, these are the four C's and we don't get them out of biblical order. Hmm. Even though the world does, even though the world celebrates it that way, we don't. We do it God's way. This was God's divine order and plan for marriage. Well, let me get to this last one so I can get a couple of these human objections that people have to marriage that I hear today from so many people. And boy, this is one I hear often from people. Well, why do I need a piece of paper to be married? I, I, we, don't, we can just live together. We don't need a piece of paper. What's a pe piece of paper going to add to that? Well, you know what? When someone says that, they're, they're doing the often error that is made in our day that defines love in only one way, and that is romantic love, feeling, emotional love. Thank God for that. I'm glad I, I feel and love my wife, and, and, and I, I know what that feeling is of love towards her, that romantic love that, that, that brings an emotional uh, quality to it. But, but what do we know about the Bible teaches about love? Love is not, first and foremost, a feeling. It is a fact that has action with it. That action is, I'm going to do something, even if I don't feel like it, because I love this person. Love, I mean, if it was just a feeling, Jesus didn't have a feeling. He didn't want to go to the cross. You know, Father, if you could take this away from me, I'll be glad to let you take it away from me. How many of us have prayed that prayer? But because he came to do the will of the Father, he nevertheless persevered in obedience to the Father. Why? Because he loved the Father, and he loved us, and he performed the action even though it didn't feel good. That's what love is primarily is and we completely lost that in our generation so therefore when someone says I don't need a piece of paper what they're saying is a piece of paper is not going to make me feel better about this person and they're 100% right but listen what they're really saying though is I love you but I don't love you enough to close off all of my options I love you when I say I don't need a piece of paper to say my love for you has not reached the marriage level yet and where I love you no matter what. There's some days when you don't feel married. There's, somebody say amen. I'm, I'm so tired of people getting religious faces all the time. Say, We've been married 38 happy years. Liar, liar, your pants are on fire. <laughs> Ain't no such thing. I mean, everybody has down days and down times and difficult times. But if you're going to operate just on the basis, you're going to run from one lover to the next and be so messed up. Listen, love is a fact. Love is a, a commitment. And there is feeling that comes. Thank God for that. But it starts on the basis and foundation of that. So when someone says that, they're saying, I just want to live in the realm of romantic love. And as long as I feel good, that's, that's good. But the problem is you're not going to feel good forever. 
And some days you're going to feel better than others. And that doesn't take away the fact and the commitment that you've made to one another. Can I say this one? Because I hear it all the time. I also be honest on Sunday morning. I hear this from people different ways, but here's what they say. Well, I don't want to believe in that marriage deal. I cannot be expected to be intimate with only one partner my entire life. Are you kidding? I mean, I hear that all the time from people. I hear it on, in the world. You know, that's, that's, that's the old days. I couldn't expect to just have one partner my whole life. I heard Jack Hayford. I wish I could say I said this, but Dr. Hayford, great pastor for many, many years, just went to heaven this past year, pastor of the church on the way in Van Nuys, California, godly, godly man. And he's still on the platform in a conference I was attending one time and had his lovely wife up there with him. They'd been married over 50 years at that time. And he looked at her, you know, two old people. We're getting closer to 50 years, you know, so they're looking like us, but two old people standing up there. And you know what he did in front of his whole congregation? He said, I'll tell you something. He said, what me and Anna have over 50 years of marriage does not even compare at all to a thousand one-night stands. Think about that statement for a minute. When he said that, I went, whoa, they talk pretty plain out here in California in the pulpit. But I got to think about it. He's telling the truth. He's telling the truth. It's an amazing. See, you, you can't experience what God has for you if you're moving from here to there and there, back and forth and i got to have this experience. See, that's what the world says. But God says, listen, I'll give you something richer and deeper that only can be experienced in the faithfulness of a lifetime. That is so powerful. That is so powerful. Amy's grandparents were married 72 years. Married 72 years. When her grandmother passed away, I went back to Chattanooga to do the, the funeral, and her grandfather was not a man of many words. One of the first things I ever heard him say was when we decided we were getting engaged to get married, he was an old Roosevelt Democrat, and I was pulling for Reagan in those days. He said, this is what he said, I only had one granddaughter, and she married a dang Republican. You know, that's what, that's what he said about me. You know, that was my introduction to him. But when we went to the funeral there, 72 years married. And I said, Mr. Thornburg, 72 years, what an accomplishment. I said, how old were you when you got married? And he said these words would be out of it. He said, yeah, he said, we should have been playing marbles. And we ran off and got married. I said, marbles, is that like 1,200 or something, you know, back there, you know, playing marbles? He said, we should have been playing marbles. And we ran off and got married. 72 years of faithfulness. 72 years of faithfulness. Unbelievable. Marriage, this is the one I hear too, and I close with this one. Marriage is a patriarchal social construct. In other words, it's just something society has, has invented to put women down, make men greater. Marriage is the cornerstone of an orderly society. Christianity did not put women down. Christianity liberated women. In a world where they were treated as property, where in a world where they were treated as not even human beings, even in a Jewish court of law, a woman could not testify, and all of these things. It was Christianity that elevated women to a mutually submissive relationship as husband and wife. It was the New Testament that did that very thing. I can't get over it. I was talking about her, her grandparents being married that long, and I, I, I go back to the first funeral that I did after I, when I was a pastor. I did some before. But when I was a pastor, I was in Hattiesburg, Mississippi, and I was pastor of a brand new church there. We were meeting in school, building a building, and, and I remember they called me, and they said, there's a couple that kind of loosely connected with us over here that they, they need a pastor. So he died. And the, the man, I don't know if you know what this is, he was a truck farmer. They had no money. And our little old church didn't have much at all at that time. I was making $18,000 a year and had a baby on the way. I didn't have any money. And, and you know, I didn't, we didn't have any way really to help them. We did the best we could to raise a little money. And basically, you know, if you understand what I mean, at the funeral home, and I've been there too many times, and when you don't have any money, you buy the box. The box is the cheapest casket you can get, and it's not much more than a box. And on the day it came to bury this man, it was raining, they didn't have a vault. They couldn't afford all that stuff. And we're there, and she's weeping. And, and I found out they've been married for over 50 years. And I mean, they've been married for about two years at that time. 
And I just never forget being overwhelmed with the idea, how in the world can you even go on after you've been married that long? And I just, I mean, I was young, and, I just, and, and through the years, doing those types of things, I never get over that fact. And you know why? Because I have a unique relationship with the woman I married, obviously. We know each other. We can finish each other's sentences. We, we, we've been through a lot, and what we've been through has strengthened us and made us stronger. And there's just so, it, you know what I'm talking it's, it, You can't put words on it. And you think about one day standing there, as I've had to do just recently with some of our church, and having to say goodbye, and I'm just overwhelmed at that. And then I stumbled across this scripture, and those in my Bible study, we've talked at length about this, but I share this with the entire church. Uh, Jesus was arguing with the Sadducees one day. The Sadducees didn't, they were the liberals of their day. They were the progressives. They didn't believe anything. They didn't believe in the resurrection. And I love what Jesus said. This is what every liberal needs to hear. Jesus said, when they came to him and said, you know, what if a woman's married to this man, he dies, she gets married again, and he gets married again, they get married and he dies, and they get married and they've had four wives, and they get to, who, which wife is he, the husband are going to be in the resurrection? And Jesus looked at him and said, you know, you don't even believe in the resurrection, and said this, you do greatly err because you do not know the power of God nor the scriptures. That's what Jesus said. A, a liberal is someone who comes up with all these great progressive ideas, but they do not know the scriptures nor the power of God. Then Jesus said these words, because in the resurrection, we will neither marry nor be given in marriage, but are like the angels in heaven. Now, I've always known that scripture, but I was looking back over it this past year with a couple of the key funerals we've had in our church this year. And I was thinking about that verse, and I thought, Lord, I don't understand this. How can heaven be heaven if I don't have that same, I mean, to say goodbye here and it's not going to be the same there? I don't understand, Lord. How can it be that way? And, you know, just not a, not a theological crisis, but just a thought that I was chewing on for a long time there when the Holy Spirit said this to me very clearly. Better. I don't know about you, but the Holy Spirit don't speak in complete sentences to me sometimes. Just drop that in my spirit, better. And it hit me like a ton of bricks. It's going to be better. How can it be better than this? It's going to be better. Listen, eye has not seen, 1 Corinthians 2, 9, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for those that love him. Oh, I don't know about you, but the more confusion and tension and everything in this world, I'm looking forward to the better. I'm looking forward to the better. It's going to be better in every way, and it's going to be so much better it cannot be described in any human revelation from God that our minds can conceive of it. So God just says, trust me, it's going to be better. It's going to be better. Listen, folks, marriage is a foundation and mandate of creation right here in Genesis 2. We walk away from these things, not to just walk away from tradition or what we've always known. We walk away from the Word of God always brings about difficulty and problems so we look back at this and say listen this is God's standard do we live up to God's standard no the Bible says for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God every one of us missed the mark in some way or other line every one of us up with a bow and arrow every one of us is going to miss the bullseye some of us are going to miss the whole target now some of us just going to miss but all of us are going to fall short but this is the standard that God gives us as I said last week, and I hope you would listen to that message if you weren't here, but compassion in all things, but never at the expense of the truth of God as he gives it to us. We hold that standard and we hold it high. Let's pray together today. Heavy stuff here today. A lot of details, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of things there, but important things to see and understand from our, our Bible about these foundations that God has given us. Father, I pray over your people that are gathered here in the building today and those that have joined us and will watch and listen to this in the future. Lord, I pray, God, you would call all of us to that. Lord, there's not a, one of us that measures up to your perfect ideals and everything at all. We live in a fallen world. You recognize that and called attention to it. But, Lord, we recognize still that, Lord, we're going to be blessed the most in the kingdom when we do things the way you have called us to do them. 
So let us all, Lord, by the power of the Holy Spirit, aspire to be obedient to your word and to do what you have called us to do and do it in your order and do it with your plan. Let us give glory to you the maximum way we can in our lives. And Lord, when we fall short, may we always find ourselves in the loving arms of a Jesus who died for our sins, who rose again from the dead and has conquered death in all things. And may we always find the forgiveness that flows from you into our lives by coming with sincere repentance before you to, to, to confess before you our need for you in our lives. Father, I pray that right now in this room, pray that, Lord, anyone that, Lord, needs to know you and have that relationship with you but has so fallen short that thinks that there's no way, may they see you with your arms stretched wide on the cross. May they see you gloriously, powerfully risen from the dead. May they see you as victor and one that has provided the way and knocked down every obstacle for us to find forgiveness and relationship with you. God, they call upon your name today. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Today, oh God, we thank you for your great riches of forgiveness and your great restoration power and your great word of truth that you give us to guide us in this world. We pray that blessing over your people today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand up together today. All over the building, let's sing a song before we leave. so very much for leading us today. Pray a blessing on you before we're uh, dismissed uh, today and uh, ask God's great blessing on you this week. Let me, let me pray for you uh, today. Stay as long as you can. Those of you that are on prayer team, come on down here in the front. Be available as always. If you need somebody to pray for you, these will be here ready to minister to you before you leave uh, today. Father in heaven, I lift my hands up over your people today. As even you, the good and great shepherd, lift your hands over your people. And I pray that, Lord, you'd lift up your countenance upon them. That, Lord, you would smile upon them. That you would give them the shalom, the peace of God over their lives this week. I pray, God, for rich favor and blessings to come their way. I pray, God, you'd order their steps to bring maximum glory to your name and blessing to their life. And I pray, God, you'd fill their life full of testimony, divine encounters, opportunities, every good and perfect thing that comes down from above this week. We pray you bring us back safely to the Lord's house to worship you next Lord's Day in spirit and truth. Father, we bless you. We thank you. And in Jesus' name we pray this. Amen. Amen. God bless you.